Hands of My Podcast is a proud member of Dark Cast Network, presenting the brightest of indie podcasts. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo, and I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So, welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. Welcome to our special episode on our podcast. Today, we have an interview that is sure to bring hope and faith to all our listeners, especially those who may be feeling like giving up or thinking that there is no way to find justice or peace in the face of a loved one's disappearance or untimely death. As a podcaster, I feel honored to be the first person that the victim's families reach out to with this shocking news. It's a testament to the power of podcasts and the trust that our listeners have in us to tell their stories. The victim, in this case, is a young man and his mother has been tirelessly seeking justice for him for a quarter of a century. She has never given up hope, and now, finally, there may be a breakthrough in the case. In order to protect their identity, we have changed the names of the individuals involved in this interview. The mother, who will be sharing her story with us today, will be referred to as Elizabeth. Her son will be called Daniel, and the two daughters mentioned in our conversation will be identified as Susan and Amy. Elizabeth's story is one of resilience and strength in the face of unimaginable tragedy. She will take us through the journey of her family's experience, shedding light on the challenges they have faced and the steps they have taken to find answers and closure. Throughout this interview, Elizabeth, will share the emotions she has experienced, the obstacles she has encountered, and the support she has received along the way. Her story will serve as an inspiration to all who listen, reminding us that even the darkest times, there is always hope. We encourage you to listen with an open heart and an open mind. Elizabeth's story is a powerful one, and we hope that it will resonate with each and every one of you. Whether you have personally faced a similar situation or know someone who has, this interview is a testament to the strength of the human spirit and the power of perseverance. You have a lot to unravel today, and I am so excited yes. to hear the news. Since you, yes. when you guys called me, I was like, I was like, wait, what? Like someone pinched me. Like, wait, what? Yes, yes, yes. Well, tell me, tell me. Can you just like revisit that day and tell me exactly? Yes, I will start off on that day. So, eighteenth, uh, it was mid afternoon. I told you know what? I go. I just feel that. Um, I don't want anybody there. I'm sorry. <sighs> so I said, I really don't want anybody there. I go, I just want to, just us. I go, don't tell anybody that we're going to go to the cemetery because it was 25 years anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I just, I just want to be alone. I said, I just want us. She goes, I know mom. She goes, I was thinking the exact same thing. I said, okay. I go, so what time are we going to meet there? And she said, you know what? She goes, Let's meet there at three o'clock. I go, three o'clock? I said, okay. You know, I mm -hmm. was already living in, which takes me, it's about, I say, 35, 40 miles, you know, away. And I said, well, I'm going to drive in and I'm going to, I need to go run some errands. And she says, okay, I'll meet you there at three o'clock. I go, but don't tell nobody, you know, because usually the other grandkids, other people, other friends would go and it's, this time it just felt different. And I said, oh, she said, okay. So she, I guess she got there. I went to go do some errands. I went in and cut my hair, did my nails and, you know, did I was like, I was, I was 
wanting to be there, but I wasn't in a hurry. Why? I couldn't tell you. So I was like uh, making excuses. So, you know, okay, it's a quarter to three. What can I do before I get to the cemetery? Because I was just like, I don't know, somebody was just saying, you, you just get those feelings in you. And gone to go get some stuff to eat with my other grandchild. Uh, with and you know they're saying Nana what do you want and I'm like I really don't want anything well give me this but I was just taking my time and getting there and finally I get there and I had already gone to the to the store to get uh, uh, some flowers for him and then brings out the chairs and then we're sitting there and we get there like at three o'clock and about, I would say between 310, 315 at the latest, we see this guy coming. And he was walking towards us. And and I just looked at each other. She goes like, who is that? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, to me, he looked like a homeless guy. And as he got closer and closer, he was coming towards us. And I just looked at She goes, do you recognize him? I'm like, no. She's like, well, don't you? She goes, No. And then he comes and, you know, he introduces himself. And then we kind of hesitate and we just look at each other and we look at him. He goes, I come every, um, I come on every anniversary of his. I'm like, why? He goes, because uh, he passed away. on." And then I said, okay. He goes, and I always come at this time. And I just looked at each other because we always come after we always go to the cemetery after three o'clock. And I asked him, I go, you're the one that leaves these notes, these letters that I've been finding for all these years and saying, you know, and I, um, I, cause I had saved them. I had saved those papers and they were written on, on, you know, stuff like that. He goes, yeah, those were all for me. And he, and I said, you know, so I kind of looked at, and I wanted, I wanted a uh, confirmation. I said, what was the last one that you left? And he confirmed that, you know, because that's oh, the one I had. Wow. And I'm like, okay. And then my son-in-law had gotten there and that we had, uh, we, we had given him a chair to, to sit on. You know, we were talking, we were reminiscent of, you know, what happened that night before and, you know, prior days, months prior to everything. And nobody had ever talked about him. Nobody ever, you know, nobody ever said anything about this guy. And then like, he wanted to open up, but he was like hesitant and my son-in-law kind of got that same message so uh he you know he told us he was going to leave and all that and everything and and he did and then once my son-in-law left he started uh opening up a little bit more like he felt more comfortable we were feeling comfortable because he, we had already asked him a few questions prior for confirmation and he was able to answer and give us that confirmation so we started getting more into debt about that night and he was actually with my son one hour two at the most before my son what it, uh, before he was killed and he told us everything that had happened prior to that night and we knew some stuff but he confirmed everything that we knew that nobody else, nobody else would have known. Wow. And he told us who was there and what had happened uh, um, a couple of hours prior to everything, you know, with my son, who we got in a fight with, why they had, why they had fought. And then the, the big news came. So I just looked at each other and we both looked at each other. Like we both had that, look in our face like we wanted to know who pulled the trigger mm. and he confirmed and he told us oh and at that moment I was like oh my god mm. uh, so all these years so you know like I said I am a firm believer of the Lord and you know I'm always asking him Lord you know am I ever going to be able to get confirmation of my son you know that he did not commit suicide yeah, are you ever going to let me know? And and at that moment, I I didn't know if I should cry. I should jump up and down. I there was so much emotions going through me because he confirmed that who pulled the trigger that my son did not commit suicide. That and alone took like all these heavy 
heavy feelings that I was that I had on my chest, like they were just like pulled off. And I just I wanted to just fall on my knees and say, thank you, Lord. You know, you finally gave me the confirmation that I needed that it was it my wrongdoing of a mom that, you know, would push my son to commit suicide or, you know, those are the just things that a parent thinks about when, you know, where did I go wrong? What did what could have what would have could have should have done, you know? And and that alone right there, I mean, just I was just like, but I was still sitting down because I was just like frozen, but all these emotions were going through my body. I don't know if that makes any sense, mm-hmm. but yeah. uh, I, uh, and he confirmed and all these years for 25 years, I kept telling the Lord, when you know that I'm ready to handle it, can you please and um, right there and then I said, well, I guess the Lord thought after 25 years, I was a, I was at a good time, good place, mindset, health wise. I don't know, you know, but I guess he finally gave it to me. He gave me the justice that I needed for my son and not just for my son, because we found out at that same day, that same time, all the other lives that were taken by the same man. Mm. so all these years I was thinking it was this guy that's still alive and it's and it we were I was wrong it's Mm. not the guy that I thought it was it was actually um his Mm. but the thing about it is that uh this has now um also deceased which gave me even more peace of mind I'm like huh damn you know I'm glad he's gone because if not I would have done everything possibly to get him you know behind bars if possible right those were my thoughts but this guy you know and then we started talking more about what happened that night when he got back to the scene and it was already blocked off and all this stuff and everything and the gun was found like I said across the street in a puddle of water that was parked there was their car was parked there and when they left the gun fell out of the car. Oh, gosh. So, and I said, and had they uh, police uh, run the ballistics on it or fingerprints and all that, they would have, you know, they did a shitty job on my son's case to begin with. To, like I said, they closed it within 24 hours saying that my son had committed suicide and uh, he didn't. The guy actually was upset this mm-hmm. guy was actually um, was upset because of um, uh, the fight that they had uh, extended back to maybe three weeks up to a month of the fact that uh, uh, that something had happened and it uh, oh my god it was just like he was just giving us so much information that's like oh my god I go I, there's no way that, you know, he asked us to please keep his his uh, his name confidential. And I said, we will. We'll just, just give us more details. And he did. He did. And because he gave us all these details, I told him, we can't, I, I can't go to the police and let them know that, you know, the guy that actually killed my son is already deceased. Because they're going to say, well, where'd you get this information and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I will not. I go, I have my confirmation. The Lord has given it to me. I know that, you know, it wasn't because of my, of my wrongdoing that my son committed suicide. It's the, the, the cowardly man that took it. And like I said, he took my son and a couple of other people. And I want to go so bad to that family, but I can't reveal this man's name because there's there's still a person that's out there that dominates that's dominating of the people that knew of my son's killing mm. and they they had pledged to be his best friend they were like brothers and all this stuff and everything which it turned out to be a lie because they are still living in fear of this man which i again you know i feel i feel but I don't know, you know, how much comfort this family, other families would want to even know. Because I, we don't hear anything. We don't know anything. But uh, I've always put it out there that, you know, 
the day that my son you know, is justice, we get justice for him. I know that we're getting justice for the other people also, whether the families know or not. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, do I want to? There was some. So the cold case detective that uh, was working on it, her ex brother in law just passed away not too long ago, and I told go. I want to go to the funeral just because I want to, I want to talk to her. I want to, I want to, you know, tell her I go, but at the same time I go, I know that they're going to put pressure and they're going to want to know. And I, I, I can't, I, you know, I have to keep my word. And then if I were to do that, it would bring in them, you know, talking to my daughter and I, I don't know where that would put her. And like I said, it's full circle. Now my daughter came home. I All I can say is that you are a wonderful, loving mother. Anything that you have done, you did everything that a mother is supposed to do. You've loved unconditionally. You've loved all your children and it shows. So... I know that we, as mothers, we doubt ourselves like every step of the way because no one gives us a manual on how to be no, no. a parent. We have to learn by trial and error. And I have three boys and it's like each has their own personality. You know, you have to kind of go based on your your intuition. What's best for this child? What's best for this child? Be farther away? Should I give them space? You don't know that. And all you can say is that I, I see you and I know for, and I, I curse, I'm sorry. I know for darn sure um, that you were a wonderful mother. You've always been a mo wonderful mother and never, never doubt that. And I'm glad there's a confirmation that life um, wasn't um, taken by him. And there's confirmation um that he didn't do it himself, but confirmation that there was somebody who uh, who actually confronted you. And what I want to do is I want to keep the confidentiality as much as I can. Um, what I want to do is I would I want to reach out to someone who who can give me the specifics on how you can keep this information confidential, um, and what are the legalities of that. Um, because I want to keep your family safe. That's yes. the priority number one. Like you said, oh, that's priority yeah. number one. And finally come around and she has, um, you know, cleaned up her, her life. And I am so happy that she was able to turn this around. Well, it wasn't it, it, how it all happened was, you know, like I said, I am a firm believer. Every time I ask the Lord to help us, guide us and protect us and put my kids in the right place at the right time. And since, you know, my other grandson, he's uh, going on a year, uh, or I think it's already been a year that he's been clean. He's been doing good. He's working. Awesome. He lives with that grandson. What are we going to do when this happens, that he does put him at the right place at the right time? How are we going to help him? And, and I guess finally we got our answer, and he was put at the right place at the right time, and he's clean now, and he's working. And I tell well, we got one, um, you know, we got another one to go. So I, I was, I would pray every night and, and you know, throughout the day because I would see people in the streets and I didn't know, you know, is that, where is she? I, you know, I, would, it, I would go months without knowing, you know, where she's at, what she's doing. Oh, man. So finally, I just said, Lord, I go, please help me. I go, I need to, you know, you, you, you know, you haven't given up on me yet. And I know I'm always putting pressure, or, you know, I'm always asking, I'm always asking and. And finally, the, we got the phone call and she goes, mom, she goes, I, I think I might be in jail. And I'm like, why? She goes, I got a call from the a county jail. And she goes, and I know that. And so, so while she was at work, I said, well, let me check. So I went online and I started looking and I finally, I, I did see where she got arrested. Mm -hmm. I go, you know, I, I was so glad. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I go, please don't let her get out of jail. Don't let her do this. And, you know, so she had a bail set, you know, it was only a thousand dollars. And she was, it was right before, um, a couple of days before her daughter's, um, baby shower. 
Oh, wow. And so she goes, she wants to get out. She was crying. She was, and I said, go, I don't have the money and I'm not asking you to bail her out. Uh, so she had to talk with her husband and, you know, uh, she tried to go to a bail bond, but they wouldn't do anything, you know, unless it was 2000 and up or whatever. So she ended up putting the $1,000 and got her out on bail. We gave her this, well, more like gave her this, you know, the, the rules, the stipulations and blah, blah, everything that had to go to, uh, she would have to do in order for her. And she agreed. I agreed to take her to her courts and all that. And, uh, she's been there. She's been, she was, you know, started working and I've taken her to her courts and she got a, I mean, she got a really good public defender the second time that's going to help her. So, like I said, for so for that mindset, you know, it's I told you go just every time we ask the Lord, you have to be careful because of what we wish because we we will He will grant it, but with conditions, you know. And so, with her doing good and all that and everything, I I'm not, I'm at a point where I can't. Uh, I mean, because if it weren't for I don't know where would be at right now. To be honest with you, as the one that's um. It's keeping us has kept us kind of in the glue, you know, glued together. Um, she says, Mom, I'm not as strong as I go. You are, but you just don't realize it because um, I don't love my kids. I love my kids uh, unconditionally, but I can't say I love one more or the other. But it, in my case, if it hadn't been for my oldest and for where she's at in her in her life right now, I don't know where I would be, where would be where her son would be and mm. you know I guess you know my my son-in-law is he's more like a son uh if it weren't for them too yeah. we would be in a totally different place totally you know and she doesn't realize that you know and I've made my mistakes oh my god I've made my mistakes you know throughout the years with my kids but that mean um I didn't I you know I didn't I didn't love one more or the other they're like you said they're three different personalities three different you know mm -hmm. my son had the like I said the HADD or the autism and then you know I don't know I haven't sat down with to ask her what she knew because I don't want to put her back in that situation to, um because I know she's she's and I've talked about it that maybe that's why it turned out certain ways because she was carrying all this guilt we don't know what guilt or we don't know any of that so we really haven't asked her at least I haven't I don't know if has but I I can't have I'm not uh, I'm not in a place right now at a time to have that conversation with her mm -hmm. but I've always told we've always agreed that she's always known more than she sh you know cared to share which is fine Cause we don't know if she's been threatened because she's, you know, knows this other person and stuff like that. But, um, I, 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 I can't jeopardize what we're, where we're at right now Absolutely. and with, with the kids. And like I said, I don't know. I just ask the Lord daily, you know, to guide us and protect us and, you know, put us in the right place and just keep opening the doors and shut the ones that we know need to be shut. And, so that's where we're at right now, Jasmine. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Everything that you said, the doors are opening and closing based on the time that you of your strength. And everything's going to be in its place. Um, we'll definitely come around when she is ready to. And it's like, and I have a son that's 11. He's actually um, 11 years old and he is on the autism spectrum as well he's a, has a sensory processing disorder so mm -hmm. when you talked a lot about a hit personally with me because I was completely baffled in regards to how do you you know how do I handle this child this how this child is completely different like an exotic bird how do you handle <laughs> a child with so many different like wiring and nuances and different in his world his perspective of the world is completely different than the mm -hmm. other kids and to me and, and it opened up my mind in looking at it in a different view and everything that you've done as a mother you know like I said everything's a trial and error and everything you've done 
was based on love. So even if you made these mistakes, it was made because you were in the process of growing as well. You were learning, you were developing, you were becoming more um, aware of what your kids needed at that moment. And it's, it's never going to be perfect. It's what they well, needed. I know that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what they needed. And they have a mother that's always been there for them, who's never gave up on them. That's the best thing ever. No matter how many mistakes that have gone or how many per things you've done perfectly, I think kids remember is that their parents were always there no matter what, unconditionally. That's what they remember the most. And you did the best. You did 200% mm -hmm. then. And I, and I see you. Oh. No, it was, was uh, I remember that say, oh, he's your favorite, but <laughs> he wasn't my favorite, but at that time when, you know, growing up and he was always, you know, getting picked up for curfew and I was always working late. I had to go, you know, straight from work. I had to go pick him up where, wherever they had him at the time, because they would, they would be like, um, after school program um uh they just had him in different places so he he would call and say okay when you get off work i'm over here now and i'm over here now and you know i had to spend more time uh, trying to understand what he was going through because it was hard for me too because i would say what's wrong with my son why can't they help him why can't you know why does it have to be with medication because he didn't like taking the medication because he said that would make him feel weird you know, so so if he was uh, he couldn't stay home because the girls had you know they were doing their own thing. I had to work, and I would I would try to work days so I can be there at night. But sometimes I had to work split shifts, so it was uh, it was hard. It was hard, but I tried to do everything they asked me to do with him, and so I entrusted him with these people that knew exactly what happened on the night of 18th. Mm -hmm. I entrusted him with them thinking of that. And, and it, and it did make, it made more sense. I got confirmation on this. Um, like I said, this went on his 25th anniversary and I'm like, Oh my God. And I just, and that's when I just said, Lord, I go, I know that you were preparing you were preparing me for this day, for this justice, but it took 25 years. And I think that's how long it took me to be prepared. Because mm -hmm. even, you know, after this guy had to leave, and I just looked at each other and we just hugged and I just started crying. I'm like, oh my God, all the wrong things I, you know, I did thinking that I was doing good for your brother knowing that you know not knowing that the person that I entrusted in him with was actually another mm -hmm. and that's another thing that I, I can't reveal that because he knows the extended reason he knows my kids and my grandkids and um, what I can do because I know that I work with a lot of um different types of people who do investigations and pro bono and stuff like that. Would you feel comfortable for me to reach out? And I won't say any names. I won't identify who I'm talking about specifically, like mm -hmm. your name or anything. I will say what, what would a mother who has received some information about uh, a possible perpetrator that is connected to her son's murder what would be the ways that she can go about in providing information without being harmed or putting her family in danger? And I could ask that question for you and to see what you are able to do. Or if you, it is of your preference, if you prefer to just le let it be and just um, have me change the names in our conversation to kind of keep things confidential and just be at at that um it's of your preference what would you like to do you can sleep on it too just let me know what your thoughts are yeah but the the main thing i want people to understand jasmine and to realize that um 
there will always be justice. There's no perfect murders out there Mm -hmm. at all. And like I said, it took me 25 years on the day of my son's murder. Because um, I used to always say, well, you know, it's the day that my my son died. No, I can actually affirm now that, you know, my son was murdered. And it's not going to change anything on his death certificate. It's not going to bring him back. But it's given us peace. I don't, oh I, um, that, and I just want people, don't ever, ever give up. The Lord will give you what you need at the time that he feels that you are ready to accept it. Like I said, it took 25 years of the Lord preparing me for this. Because I don't know, maybe other at other times how I was, state my, I, I don't know. I mean, only the Lord knows, you know, why it, um, it took me. Like I said, um, I can talk about my son. I can start crying, but then other people, I can talk to other people and, and not shed a tear because I've learned to hide that and, and just keep a straight face, but I'm, you know, I'm crying in the inside and I'm dying in the inside. I, I've gone to a point to where I was told go the day that I find out I can get justice for my son. I go, if the Lord wants to take me there and then, I would go with a smile on my face and be so grateful. And saying and with saying that on that day, a few days later, I get diagnosed with something and just starts, you know, saying, Mom, she goes, I'm so scared because I'm going to I'm going to lose you. And I'm like, Well, we're all at some point you will. She goes, No, and she goes, because how I told her that once I find out I would be I would be ready to go. And she and she thinks that, you know, I had to I had to reset my retire. I'm kind of retired right now. I haven't worked since uh the uh, 24th. And she just uh and you know only I go only the Lord knows when I'm gonna go and you know why things are happening the way they're happening. What's you know I'm at a good, I'm in a good place right now. I said, health wise, you know, I'm struggling, but I'm at peace. And that's, it's so, it's, it's a peace that I have not felt in many, many years, like yeah. probably the whole 25 years that my son's been gone. Yeah. And like I said, the kids are good, good, good. Every, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's scary that I'm not stressed about the family and I you know it's uh there's other little things that can stress me out but like I said only the Lord knows what's what's in store and I just don't want people to ever give up on trying to get justice you know don't believe don't stop believing in the Lord ask when you're going to ask for something be you know be prepared for the for the outcome that he's going to give you mm-hmm. That's all I can say. You know, it's like, don't give up. Don't give up. And like I said, it took 25 years for my justice, but I got it. We got it. And it feels amazing. Yeah. It feels amazing. I'm so happy um, that you are, after almost a quarter of a century, literally a quarter of a century. Yes. Um. I am so happy that you are at with peace on this. Um, and I think it is, and I'm so glad that you're, we are able to talk about the coming at the end result of your justice, you know, looking for justice for your son. And the result is beautiful that you were able to have less burden, less uh, frustration, less, e- you know, just emotions involved of, you know, is 25 years of just fighting for this justice. And I'm glad that you were able to get this peace. And I'm, I'm thankful to speak with you because there's a lot of other families that I would love to share just that part of our conversation. Oh, yes. Um, because this is, this is, there's so many other ones that have been out there for 
going on 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, even more. And I'm so thankful. Um, if only we were under different circumstances, um, you, but you mm -hmm. are my family, no matter what. And I am so grateful to be part of your circle to share this, this moment, um, uh, with me. And thank you. Um, we are coming at a close. I didn't know. I think I have about a minute and 30 seconds mm -hmm. left of our conversation. Um, cause I didn't want to take too much of your time. Um, I'm retired. Remember? <laughs> yeah, you got. Well, I got like you know. <laughs> maybe I should say uh, more. You know, I have other things. It's a Friday for me, and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to spend some time with my my little one because my other oh, two yeah. ones are already grown yeah. up. They're 27 and 18, and I oh, have one Lord. left in the nest. One left in the uh -huh. in the little little uh, home nest. That's. Uh, yeah. So, um, cherish it. <laughs> yeah, we try to spend as much time as possible, but um, I want to just extend my love and and thankfulness that you have kept me in your circle as a family, as part oh, of your yeah. family. And um, say hello to for me. I don't want to cut yeah. off our conversation, but I think I have less than a minute. I want to express your story about never giving up hope. Oh, yeah, search for justice if it comes down to that. So. Yes. I cannot stress enough how important it is for us as podcast listeners to use our platform to support victims and their families. True crime podcasts have the ability to shed light on unsolved cases and bring justice to those who have been wronged. I want to thank all of our loyal listeners for their continued support. Without you, we wouldn't have the opportunity to tell these important stories. Your engagement and dedication to justice are what make our podcast possible. Together, we can make a difference and bring closure to the victim's family. Thank you for listening. And remember, justice is not just a word. It's a mission. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcast, And be sure to come back for our discussion of true crime stories. Starting in June, I will be switching over the podcast to be a bi-weekly pod platform. Until then, this is Jasmine Castillo. We are voiceless no more. This podcast was created, produced, recorded, researched, and edited by Jasmine Castillo current active member of Dark Cast Network, Transto Task Force, Uncovered.com, and partners with Search and Support San Antonio.